As promised, today we're going to dive into Unity's distributed authority solution. Let's start by updating our sample code so that we can see exactly how to code for distributed authority and how that works. Then we can see how to transfer ownership of objects between players. Finally, we're also going to look at how to calculate latency between players and handle prediction in faster moving games where some players might be lagging behind. If you're just joining us, I'll leave a link to last week's video in the description. Let's get started. I'm going to use last week's code as a starting point for talking about distributed authority. To keep it simple, instead of using the widget to specify a session name, I'm just going to set one right here in code. Then I'm going to remove this code where I'm starting the session as a host. In distributed authority, any player can be the host of the game, and the concept of having a fixed host goes out the window. Instead, let's create a new session options. I'll set the name to be our session name, and I'll set max players to be four. Now, in last week's video, we were starting it as a relay network, but today we're going to do something different. Instead of with relay network, we're going to use with distributed authority network. And instead of using the create session async, we're going to use the create or join session async method. This means the first client to start up will create the session and technically be the session owner. We'll set the result of that call as our active session. Now, the first player that came in is technically the session owner, but that's not the same thing as being a host. In a traditional setup, the host would have authority over all of the network objects. In distributed authority, the responsibility for running the simulation gets distributed between all of the players. This means that each player has ownership or authority over a certain portion of the objects being simulated in the game. The best way to see this is back in Unity. There's just a few settings to change here. If I jump over to my network manager, if we look at the network topology setting, you can see right now it was set to client server. I'm going to change this to be distributed authority. If I come over to the Unity transport component, you want to make sure that the protocol type is set to be Unity transport. Then as a final step, I'm going to add the session manager script that we were just working on to this network manager object. I've already initialized a player two in my multiplayer play mode settings. So all we have to do is press play. Now, as soon as all the initialization and the authentication is done, we'll have a brand new session and two players should be spawned into it. You can see they spawned right on top of each other as we expected. So that we can see this a little more clearly, I'm going to jump over to game view and I'll just move this player out of the way a little bit. And then I'll grab player two's view and I'll move this cube out of the way as well. Now, if we come back to our main editor, and jump over to scene view. Over in the network visualization, you can click on ownership. This is extremely useful as you start to add more and more objects, you're gonna see exactly who owns what. So player one owns any object in scene view that's marked as purple. And player two has this more cyan kind of color. Let's jump back into code and add some more features so that we can spawn objects for each player to own. It's a good idea to keep track of when players are actually joining the game. So let's keep a reference here to the network manager. As part of our startup routine, we could get a reference to that component. The network manager has all kinds of events that you can hook into. Two of the more useful ones are on client connected callback and on session owner promoted. Why don't we set up a few handlers for these? Anytime a new session owner is promoted, this event gets triggered on all connected clients. For now, let's just use it to check, is this player the session owner? We can output that to the console. The other callback is also very useful because you want to make sure that a player is actually connected before you start spawning any objects. Here we can check the local client ID to see, is it this player? And if so, let's output a useful message to the console. You can also use the callback on connection event for this purpose as well. So how about we spawn some game objects? We can set a prefab here and the number that we want to spawn, say 10 in our start method. First, let's check to see if this player has authority. If they don't, we return. Now, has authority is network topology agnostic. In a client server setup, this would take the place of an is server check. But in distributed authority, it really means is owner. So what I'm saying here is if I'm not the owner of this script, get out of here. For this initial spawn of objects, I also only want the session owner to do it and not anyone else. So let's start by generating a bunch of random points where we can spawn these objects. We can iterate over the number of prefabs we're going to spawn, and we can just generate some random points in an annulus around the origin point. Then let's actually spawn these into our game. So for each prefab, first let's instantiate it. Let's get its network object component. Let's set its position to a random point, 
and then let's call network object dot spawn. So the first player to join our game is going to spawn 10 objects in random positions. But let's find out what happens when another player joins the game. First, let's quickly make an object that we want to spawn. I'm going to make a sphere, let's say. I'll just call it something like spawned object. Now, our spawned object is going to need a network object component. So let's add that quickly and have a quick look at this component. Take a quick look at the ownership property. You can see right now it's set to be distributable. This dropdown represents the network object dot ownership status enum. It's important to know the difference between these things. When you set it to none, that means the network object is considered static and can't be redistributed. Distributable will mean that it's automatically redistributed when any client joins or leaves. Transferable means that you can transfer immediately between players. Request required is similar, but the owner has to approve. Session owner means that only the current session owner can have ownership over this object. Let's set our spawned objects to be distributable and transferable. Then I'm going to add one more component to this that'll make the demo a little bit more useful. This package comes with a component that will change the color of any spawned object based on the ID of the owner. Now, just a few steps left. First of all, let's drag this down into the prefabs folder. Then we can remove it from the hierarchy. Then if we select our network manager here under network prefabs lists, we can keep scriptable object lists of all the things we want to spawn in. So let's go into the existing one and I'm going to drag our spawned object as a new item into this list. Once that's all set, let's come back to our player prefab because I'm going to add that object spawner component onto it. With that in place, we just need a reference in our object spawner to the network object we actually want to spawn. So I'll come back here, drag in our spawned object prefab. Now everything's basically ready, but there's one more setting I just want to point out before we get into it too far. If we come back to our spawned object prefab, let's come over to its network object component here where it says don't destroy with owner. Let's turn this on so that if one of my players leaves the game, all of the objects that it owns don't also leave with them. Instead, we want them to be redistributed to the remaining players. Now I'm going to hit play but I'm going to pause my recording as soon as the first player's in the game. This should only take a second. All right, well, they both came in so fast, it happened in one frame. So I've paused it here. You can see that player one owns all of the spawned objects. Now I'm going to unpause and immediately we see the redistribution so that player one and player two each now own five objects. In this manner, the workload is not all dependent on player one anymore. Player two is going to run the simulation for half of the objects. If I bring up player two's window here, let's take a look at the messages in the console. Here we can see a unique message for each object that was distributed from client one over to client two. Working as expected, but what happens if we add another player? Let's come back over to the multiplayer play mode tab, and I'm going to start up a player three. Now we should see a change not only in our ownership of the network visualization, but we should see some colors change here as well. There we go. So player three has a red color and you can see right away they took ownership of four of the objects. They took two away from player one and two away from player two. Now let's turn off player three as if they had disconnected. If I uncheck the box, they're out of the game. And as soon as the game knows that they're out, all the objects get redistributed again so that each of the remaining players now again has control of five objects each. So that's distribution in a nutshell and is very useful for spreading the workload over all of the players. But let's take a look at how we can actually transfer ownership from one player to another. We can write a little script that we can add to the player prefab that'll let us do this. Let's suppose we just have to get close to an object and then we'll take ownership of it. So we could have a pickup radius, maybe two, we're going to pick up objects that have a specific tag and I'll add this pickup tag to the spawned object prefab. In our update method, let's check to see if we have authority and if we're spawned. Both those conditions have to be true for us to continue. Let's use an overlap sphere to find all the colliders within our radius. Then for each of those colliders, we can check to see if it's got the tag. If not, continue. If we've found one of these objects that we can pick up, let's grab its network object component. If it's null or hasn't been spawned yet, just continue. Then we can say, if we're not yet the owner of this object, let's log something out to the console, and then we can call the change ownership method, passing in our local client ID. Then maybe somewhat useful, we could add it on draw gizmos just to draw the pickup radius around our player. Let's jump back into Unity and see how this works. 
First, let's add this new script to our player prefab. It's already set up with the values we need. If we come back and find our spawned object prefab, I'm just going to make sure I put the tag on it so it's tagged as pickup. We also want to make sure that it's distributable and transferable. That's it. Let's hit play. I'm going to stay in game view this time. Let's just give it a minute to authenticate and actually start up our session. Once both the players spawn in, we should see two different colors. So player one was gray. Let's start moving around and see if we can actually turn some of the red objects to gray as soon as we get close to them. There we go. I got one. There's another one. So that's it in a nutshell, but we might as well make sure it works the other way. Let's come back to player two here and see. Yeah, there we go. No problem. So, so that looks really good. If you ever need to transfer ownership from one player to another, maybe you want reduced latency or some other reason. It's just that simple. We can see here in scene view as well that one of the players now owns seven of the objects. The other one only owns three. So latency might be one reason you want to transfer ownership, but how do you actually know what the latency is between these different players? Unity's actually built quite a nice ping tool already, but let's build a lightweight version of it. We don't need the fancy GUI and everything. Let's call this class distributed ping, and let's say I want to make a ping 30 times a second. We can keep our results in a dictionary that we can key by client ID. When this object spawns, as long as we have authority, let's start a coroutine, which is called ping routine. Let's run this routine as long as we're spawned and we're still connected. For every single player that's registered with a client ID, as long as it's not us, we don't need to ping ourselves. Let's get the current server time and then we're going to send that as an RPC to each one of these other clients. Then we can just yield return on one divided by our ping interval. So 30 times a second. Now let's write our ping RPC. That's going to take in our sent time and any RPC params that we sent in. Let's make sure we annotate this method with the RPC attribute. Now, if you've never seen this before, client RPC and server RPC are legacy features of netcode. Now we use the universal RPC attribute. And here we can say that the recipient who we're sending this to has been specified as a parameter. When we called this method up in our coroutine, we specified this parameter as RPC target dot single, and we passed in the client ID. We also passed in the sent time so we can stash this in this client's table. We'll set it as having come from the sender's ID. And all we have to do is subtract sent time from the current server time. That should be the latency between this client and the client that sent the ping. Now you could take this a little bit further and you could have a pong method if you wanted to calculate the return trip time. Here, just keep passing in the sent time, but change the target to be the player that initiated the ping. So our Pong method will look extremely similar. Again, let's make sure we annotate it correctly. Then we can figure out the round trip time by subtracting the current time minus the original sent time. We know who's pinging us back because RPC params has a property receive that contains the sender client ID. You could store that in a table or you could make a bigger, more complex structure if you wanted. For now, why don't we create a public property so that we can get the ping result for any other player. And maybe in the update method, we could create a for loop that would go over the table. And as long as it's not us, because we'll have zero latency with ourselves, we can put this out using log wins. We could show all the pings for all of the players relative to this player. Back here in Unity, let's add this new script to our player prefab. I am, however, going to change the 30 to take this all the way down to 1. Otherwise, the numbers will be unreadable. They'll be coming in so fast. So let's hit play. And as soon as everybody's joined in, we'll start seeing some numbers coming up in the Logwin tab that I have. If you're interested in any of these assets you see me using for development, I'll try and list all of them in the description of the video. OK, let's have a look at this ping. So it's going once every second here. You can see the values vary quite a bit, and they're coming in as milliseconds. I'm also running this from the editor and not a build. So in a real game, if you were going to track latency, you might want to store a lot of values, maybe a circular buffer, and calculate an average, like a rolling average of maybe 30 pings a second. So if we know that there's a certain amount of latency between each player, what can we actually do with that information? Well, Noel Stevens from Unity Multiplayer actually wrote an interesting post about this on Unity Discussions. And let's just walk through it quickly so we can talk about simulating client-side prediction. Let's suppose that you're building some kind of racing game. Each of your players has a child object that represents the car. It's just a visual model. We might want to have some kind of threshold for when we want to consider sending out an update. 
Then let's also get a reference to our distributed ping tool. Using the ping tool, we could add a new public property here that could represent the owner time delta. We could always get a one-way ping from us to the owner of this car transform. Then let's create a network variable that will represent the velocity of this car. And let's also get a reference to its network rigid body. We can override the awake method and we can call base awake, but then we can also cache the reference to the rigid body. Network transforms have a special method on authority push transform state. Only the person who has authority will execute this method. So the owner of the car can get its current linear velocity. And if the velocity has changed significantly, meaning more than our threshold, we're going to update our network variable with a new value. Then let's make sure to call the base method. Now let's also override on fixed update. Here we can say, if we're the owner, let's just bail out because we have no latency. However, all the other players could get the velocity's value normalized. Then we can predict the position based on latency. And using that value, we can offset the visual model. This will give us a nice smooth prediction. Finally, of course, call base on fixed update. Notice that here, you're not actually moving the transform of the parent. You're just moving the visual model around a little bit so that everything looks like it's in sync. You can let Unity handle the synchronization of the actual transform. And that's where we're going to wrap it up for today. This last example is just to give you some ideas of how you can deal with that problem in your own games. Don't forget to join us on Discord. Hit the like and subscribe button. Next week is going to be the 100th video on this channel, which sounds crazy. I've got a big one planned. So hit the bell if you don't want to miss out on that. Maybe I'll see you there.